What's next? This is a question we're all having to ask and answer more frequently. I'm Jenny Blake, your host of the Pivot Podcast and author of Pivot, The Only Move That Matters is Your Next One. For show notes from this episode, visit pivotmethod.com slash podcast. If change is the only constant, then let's get better at it. Here we go. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to have longtime friend Paul Angoni here with me today. Paul is a voice to and for the millennial generation. He created allgrownup.com in March of 2011, which is how we first connected. Paul actually wrote for life after college for many years because our books are practically siblings in this space. And he has proven time and time again that he knows how to create sticky, highly shareable content for the 90 million plus that make up the millennial generation with articles like 25 signs you're having a quarter life crisis and 21 secrets for your 20s spreading like internet wildfire. The second article actually landed him a book deal called 101 Secrets for Your 20s, which launched his foray into self-employment in 2013 and will be sold at a target near you starting in May, which is so exciting. Paul is also the author of All Grown Up, Searching for Self, Faith, and a Freaking Job, and his latest book, the topic of today's show, 101 Questions You Need to Ask in Your 20s, and I'm assuming 30s, 40s, and beyond. Paul, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jenny. That was a great intro. I appreciate it. What inspired you to look at the power and importance of good questions? Why write a whole book about it? Yeah, that that is a great question. See, you're already doing it, Jenny. You know where where would we be? Where would we be without great questions? I mean, seriously, podcasts. We wouldn't. And and it pulls out. I mean, it really is the difference between having a very surface answer or a very deep answer. Right. And it's usually prefaced by the question that is being asked to bring us to that place. And so I I think for a lot of us, especially in our 20s, our 30s, but in our entire lives, we're on this search for answers. And especially in your 20s, when you're trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life, who you're going to marry, where you're going to live, what's your career going to be like. There's a lot of questions in there, but it's it. But it's asking the right questions so that we're hopefully pointing our ship in the right direction. Because if, if we're starting with a bad question or a faulty question or a faulty premise, then we might make progress, but it might be progress in the complete opposite direction that we actually wanted to travel in. So then it's actually the opposite of progress. We're actually going backwards, but we never knew it because we didn't start with some really good questions to begin with. And it's so true that we can't even begin to understand ourselves until we have the awareness to ask the questions. You're so right. The and, answer's and it, not going to be there necessarily right away. No, and 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 I think a lot of us we get stuck with the big broad question of, you know, how am I going to make money? Right. Or, or who how, am I? Or who am I? <laughs> or how am I going to be successful? Yeah. Which even that question, you know, as we all know, well, we got to break that down. Well, what is your definition of success? Is it your parents' version of success? Is it your version of success? Is it what it what does that mean when you get down to the why? You know, and I know why, you know, finding your why is is becoming big now. We're talking about that a lot. But really that's the essence. That's the main question is okay, not the what and the how, but the why. And let's drill that down to even, you know, and taking that to relationships. You know, why do you want to marry this person? Hmm. You know, and this this goes into all facets of our life. I love how one of the categories of the book, there's four of them. They're adulting to win, careerish, relationshiping, and signature sauce. And yeah, all, all four categories. Yeah, kind of just trying to encapsulate all of life in one book. I want to give people, too, a sense for the types of questions, because I kind of expected that the book would be just big, open-ended pretty serious questions like, you know, why do you wake up every day? And big ones, the big ones are because of what challenging. But Paul throws in some funny ones too. So we have, what's the best way to break up with myself? Uh, Am I struggling to make it appear like I'm not struggling? If I'm going to pursue a big dream, am I willing to drive a 1993 Honda Civic hatchback with no power steering, no air conditioning, and no right mirror for 15 years? <laughs> <laughs> we even talked about how you and your wife lived in a closet, slept in a closet. 
We, we did. Didn't we didn't live. We, yeah, we, we had our bed in a closet uh, and we had two kids and they had the master bedroom and we slept in the master bedroom closet. That was large, but <laughs> let's be honest, it was a closet. Um, and then the Honda Civic one that you mentioned, that's obvious. That's a very literal description because that's still the car that I drive is a 93 Honda Civic hatchback that I was given in high school. And, um, and so, yeah, that was kind of drilling down that, that one and, and all, all this in this, you know, what are you willing to sacrifice, especially if you're going to pursue something bigger. And for me, that was always writing books, being a published author, speaking, creating my own career. But there was a lot of sacrifice along the way, as I'm sure many of you know as well. So it's that idea of what are you willing to sacrifice? And then what are some non-negotiables that you're not willing to sacrifice? So both, you know, on, on both kind of the same plane of the question, but different sides of the question of, okay, I'm willing to sacrifice not being able to drive a nice car or not having nice stuff all the time. But what am I not willing to sacrifice? Well, I'm not willing to sacrifice my family Mm. and not spending time with my family. So that's a non-negotiable for me. So I'd much rather do that and not make as much money than driving a really nice car, but not seeing my family as much. So that that's what, how it works for me. But again, it's going to be different for each one of us when we ask ourselves that question. Mm. You, when you live I keep saying lived, oh my goodness. It's you, pretty true. <laughs> when you slept in the closet with your wife. This was after you quit your job, right? Yeah, this was after. You know, this was that kind of, and I'm sure many of us can relate, if you've done entrepreneurial stuff and if you tried to go full-time on your own, there's kind of that weird, awkward stage, I think, for a lot of us. And maybe and maybe it's that way all the way through. But, but the stage where you're transitioning from full-time salary work and I was doing the side hustle all along. I was growing the platform and I got a book published when I was still working a full-time job. But at some point I had to make the leap and I wasn't making the same amount of money that I was with my salary. So it was, it was definitely a leap. So there's definitely those few years, you know, it was a good two, three years when we were kind of doing whatever it took to cut back on expenses. And that meant living with my wife's parents for a short season, about eight months and that was that was a little rough <laughs> living back with your wife's parents when you have two kids yourself and then that meant sleeping in a closet because we couldn't afford like a, a gigantic place in San Diego because it's kind of expensive um so yeah we've made a lot of those sacrifices along the way and and uh it taught us a lot it trained us it grew a lot of humility and perseverance uh but it also motivated us to keep working hard so that we didn't have to stay in that place how did you know when it was time to take the leap? You know, I just, I couldn't manage both worlds anymore at the same time and do them both well. Yeah, that's exactly how I felt too. Yeah, it was just, it was just too much. It was just very clear. Either I'm going to get fired at some point from my job because I'm just not going to be able to sustain it, or I just have to give up the dream. Uh, which was, you know, writing and trying to help really 20 somethings. That was my goal, you know, broken, hurting, frustrated, uh, confused 20 somethings. Cause that's how I felt for many years of my twenties. So that was always my dream. I want to help that person. Cause I know what it's like. And when I had my first book come out, 101 secrets to your twenties, it was, it was successful, but as many authors know, you know, it wasn't run away, change your whole life. You get to sit on the beach now successful. Uh, it wasn't selling a million copies, but it was at least enough momentum that say, Hey, there is really something here. We have a book deal. Things are growing, but yeah, we got to either make a choice. We got to put our money where our mouth is to the, for the cliche phrase. And so we just went for it. And thankfully I have an amazing wife, uh, and, and spouse who, who is willing to take risks with me. And we're really partners in everything too. You know, she edits everything I write. Mm. She's really my business partner as well as my spouse, as well as the mom of my kids. You know, we kind of do every facet of life together in certain ways. One thing I love is that we talked about some of the sacrifices you've made after quitting your job and to get this business off the ground. But before we hit record, you were telling me about how you and your wife make a point to both work part time so that you can both be home with the kids in alternating times of the day and week. Yeah. You know, I, maybe this, I think this is a definitely more pro prototypical millennial thing. You know, if we're going to generalize millennials, I think we're trying to change or we're just continually changing the dynamic of what does it mean to raise kids? 
And uh, for us, one of our goals, you know, when we asked that question way back when of, you know, what do we want our life to look like? It was this vision of both being able to raise our kids. So not me just raising our kids or not her just raising our kids or not having somebody else raise our kids. We're like, if we can make it work, I, I, we would love it if we could both raise our kids. And and so that's what we've done to varying levels of success throughout our 10 years of marriage is – um you know, going back and forth where she's working part time, I'm working. And right now she works about four hours a day. I'm working in the mornings and the evenings, but then I watch our kids during those four hours. And so we have this kind of trade off, you know, it's like you're passing the baton many different times throughout the day, uh, except your baton is, you know, toddlers and, <laughs> and crying kids, you know, so it's an interesting way to do life, you know, and it, it's not simple. And, it, and we could probably be making more money if we weren't doing it this way. Uh, but man, I, I'm really thankful that I get to, you know, take my kids on a walk at 11 in the afternoon and, and just hang out with them and get to know them and, and be there for them as much as I can. I think it's so beautiful how you've applied that. You're right. It's kind of this, um, even if it's not limited to millennials, is that the time we're in is about more creative approaches to life and work. And so to hear how creatively you're approaching family, just family and child rearing is really cool. And, and hearing you say that you and your wife individually, you could probably earn more and get more done if neither one of you was splitting the time, but that, that doesn't, that only considers success in terms of money and, yeah. and a material progress, let's say. But what you're incorporating yeah. is this priceless quality time into the equation where your kids get to have both parents so present. You're right. And, and again, I'm not saying this is, this is the answer or, oh, if you're not doing this, you know, oh, you're missing it. Um, you know, we each have to do our own thing and make it work in our own way. But I guess it gets back down to kind of where you started. It's, it's those questions that we're asking that are bringing intentionality to our choices, you know, cause, I, cause, cause we're all intentional in some way. I think the problem is most of us are intentionally unintentional. So it's kind of, we kind of get into that habit of letting life just happen to us. And it's like, we're powerless. You know, it's like, oh, well, I got promoted and it happened. I couldn't turn it down. And now I'm working 75 hours a week, but what do I do? I, I couldn't have changed things. Hmm. Well, that might be true and it might not be true, but, you know, but, but let's ask some questions about that. Let's, let's bring some intentionality, some intentional intentionality into figuring out, okay, is this really the path you want to be on? And if it's not, you know, how, how you so accurately put in your book, you know, those pivot moments. And, and really, it's those pivot moments where you're asking really good questions. And then you're making a slight pivot based on your answers. Mm. That's hopefully setting you in a better direction than you were previously. I love this idea of questioning assumptions. I'm just reading a book called When the Body Says No. Understand, I'm going to to paraphrase the subtitle because I don't remember off the top of my head, but something like the stress disease connection mm. by, by Dr. Gabor Monte, who's written two other fascinating books on ADD and addiction. Mm. Uh, the addiction one is called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. In any case, <laughs> it's a digression. It's interesting what you said about just questioning assumptions. I remember when I worked at Google, I had a thyroid problem and not to mention like breakouts all the time, acne. And my doctor at one point said, is this stress related? Or if this is stress related, try to reduce stress. Yeah. And I remember thinking, that's just not an option. Like I'd have hmm. to quit my job. And I didn't even question yeah. how I was working. I did. It wasn't at that time almost felt like a non-negotiable because I wouldn't even ask the question. Yeah. How could I reduce stress? It just felt like the, the water I was in, like a fish in a fish tank. <laughs> it's just, yeah. Was. Yeah, it's it's very powerless. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it strips you of all your power in in in, choo in in choosing your future or writing your future. You know, and figuring out okay, what is the story that I want to write or tell? You know, not literally. If you're not a writer, not literally telling that story, but but in your own life, like what story is that? And you're right. I think sometimes, most of the time, we feel helpless or we feel powerless when that's not the case at all. It just, it's maybe it's fear in some ways. Yeah. I was going to say um, it takes courage to yeah. ask these questions because sometimes 
I think sometimes asking questions like these is lifting up a rug in the psyche of our brain. Of like, yeah. What is under that rug? What have I yeah. stuck under there for years and years? Totally. You got to, you know, and I, um, I actually reached out to, you know, I know both uh, one of our mentors, both of us, you know, somebody who inspires us, Seth Godin, who I'm sure inspires many people who listen to this podcast. But I, I reached out to him for this new book and asked him, you know, what's the most important question 20 somethings and 30 somethings should be asking? And his response was instant and it was very on point. And, and, and to preface my email to Seth, I was very afraid to email Seth. We've, we've known each other a little bit. We've emailed back and forth. I've never been able to meet Seth in person. It's not like we're BFF. So I was nervous to, to email Seth Godin and ask him this question. Um, and then his response was perfect. It was, what is fear holding you back from doing? Is it worth it? And it was like he read my mind even when I emailed him, you know, that I was emailing mm-hmm. him with a lot of fear that I don't want to waste Seth's time or what is he going to think of me, all these things. But his response is, you know, what is fear holding you back from doing? And is that worth it? And I think if we get down to that second part of Seth's question and what we were just talking about, you know, most of the time if we sit down and think about it, like, is my health, you know, is my health, is my, you know, I'm breaking down health wise or my marriage is breaking down or is my, I, I'm, I'm never seeing my kids. Is that worth it? And I think a lot of times we'll get down to the root of it and say, no, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. So what do I need to change and how do I do that? Let me start doing that. So good. I loved your Seth Godin story about how you almost didn't email him. And then to get this response back, what is fear keeping me from doing? Is it worth it? I mean, it was, oh. it was spot on, you know, yeah. and, and, and that's been a fun part of the book too, is that I, I incorporate, you know, it's not like I'm just the pinnacle of wisdom <laughs> and I, and I have, so I incorporate questions from, you know, Oprah and Conan O'Brien and Seth Godin and hall of fame quarterback, Kurt Warner. And, and um, and he, I even throw a Winston Churchill question in there, you know, from a graduation speech that he did. So I bring in some some other pillars of wisdom, um, maybe a little bit wiser than me, uh, when trying to get down to again, what are these? What are this progression of questions that we should be asking uh, to to just have a more fruitful life, to feel more at peace, to be comfortable in our own skin, so to speak. I recently had Elizabeth Grace Saunders on the show to talk about her book, Divine Time Management. And she talked, we talked about the role of faith in her business and putting it forward. And I know you, your dad was a pastor. Yes. What what role has faith played for you in your books and your business? Yeah, that's part two of the question. Did you ever think about becoming a pastor? (laughs) (laughs) That is a good question. I did. I did at one point think I was going to be a pastor and the person that talked me out of that was my dad. (laughs) Interesting. Yeah. um, Although being a writer and a speaker is not that different. Let's just You know, yeah. And it it is similar in a lot of ways. And I love getting to do what I do and I could never be a pastor. I have huge, uh, you know, I've seen what it's like to run a church and all that that entails. And I just don't think it would be a good fit for me. Mm-hmm. And and I also like speaking to people from all backgrounds and, faith, and faiths. And I love being able to inspire and encourage and give hope to people from all different backgrounds, which I don't think happens all the time in church for the most part. Mm-hmm. It's usually for a certain set of uh, people and you're all speaking kind of the same language. Um, you know, and especially in a Christian background, it's, you know, we call it like Christianese. Mm. Or you throw out the certain same Bible verses. It's like, take this Bible verse twice in the morning and you'll be fine by night, you know? (laughs) And and that was a real struggle of mine for a little bit of time was I I wanted to get more authentic. I wanted to get down into kind of the nitty gritty and the struggles and the pain and the frustration and and who's really talking about this authentically. And, And so that's what I try to do in my writing. And I do bring in faith to a certain, uh, point because it's a part of my story. I, I, it's still a part of my story. And, um, and so I do incorporate that in what I write, but it's always my goal to reach people, to reach 20 somethings, to reach anybody that's hurting and hopefully to doing it in a way that's accessible. Um, 
but but you know it's never going to be perfect and if you look at even some one star reviews of you know of course every author knows their one star reviews right jenny <laughs> absolutely uh, if you if you look at one star reviews of like my first book 101 secrets to your 20s where i do talk about faith and it's just part of my story i talk about it it's an important part and um you know one review that's one star says you know i can't believe this guy talked about faith and god i hate religion i hate god i felt you know, I, I, this is a bunch of crap. So that was a one-star review. And then another one-star review was, oh, I thought this guy was a Christian. He's like a heathen. He's talking about all these other things. I hated this book. Hmm. So it was two one-star reviews about religion, but on complete opposite sides of the spectrum. Um, so you're never going to please everybody, but you know, again, authenticity, I think is really important, uh, especially for anybody that's a voice that is influencing, that is trying to lead people uh, in whatever capacity. Obviously, authenticity is huge. And so, yeah, it's a natural part of my life. I can't hide it, but it's also not something that I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to convert everybody to a certain <laughs> faith. You know, I, I want to encourage and inspire and bring people hope and bring people to, you know, deeper thinking about what they believe and why do they believe that uh, instead of, again, just unintentionally saying, well, I don't really know what I believe. Well, why? Let's talk about that. I really like how you're describing it as an aim at authenticity, and you would call it signature sauce that for you, I, because I've read your work for a long time, faith is part of your signature sauce. It's not all of who you are. And I really like how you work it into your books um, without it's just part of your story. It's who you are. It's something that guides you, but it's not overtly the focus or like you said, trying to convert people. It's just part of your story. And I, and I like that you don't feel the need to hide it or feel that you have to check it at the door somehow. So yeah, way to go on living your well, signature thank, sauce. Thank you. You know, and, and, and I think that's uh, true for all of us. And, and like you mentioned, the signature sauce metaphor, uh, you know, I came up with that when trying to, trying to break down vocation or calling or just, you know, who you are, what you're going to do, you know, getting down to those questions, but trying to figure out a way to break it down even more. And that's where that signature sauce idea came in. You know, this idea that we're all master chefs in the kitchen and we're all bringing these different ingredients together, these different flavors. And we're trying to figure out, okay, what is the, what is my signature sauce? What is the flavor that I'm going to give to the world that maybe nobody else can? What is my unique signature sauce? And it takes time and it takes a lot of experiments and failures and, you know, sauces that go up in flames. You know, <laughs> um, if you, if I love watching, you know, the Netflix series, The Chef's Table. I don't know if you've seen any of those, I've Jenny. Heard great uh, things. What it's do you so love cool. About it? Oh, because it's just, you know, from an artistic craft standpoint, hmm. it's really breaking down their story of these master chefs. And, the, and a lot of it is their story of struggle and their story of, well, I, you know, I wanted to start a restaurant like my parents did, and that completely failed. And then they go off into like the desert experience, right? Almost all of them where they go away for two years or they go away and then they figure out their own unique flavor, which is typically just bringing out the best of their culture or the best of who they are and just owning it and, and presenting it in a unique way. So for anybody that is writing or creating or starting a business, watch the chef's table because it's super inspiring. But then it became that metaphor, you know, again, that deeper metaphor of, for all of us, you know, bringing those ingredients together of your values, of your strengths, of your skills, of your story and where you've come from, of your pain and frustration that you've had to work through. Because a lot of the times that becomes your passion and your purpose is helping other people with that pain and frustration. So I love that idea of us being master chefs. Uh, and even to quote a line from Seth Godin again, you know, that it's, it's easy to fall, follow a cookbook with instructions to follow, but it's really hard to find a chef book. <laughs> that's great. You know? That's great. That's up to each of us. We got to create that chef book. That's, that's for you. That's for me. That's for everybody listening. Create your chef book. One thing that can get in the way of that is something you call an additional kind of OCD, obsessive comparison disorder. 
Yes. Please explain, because I think so many of us fall Gosh. into this from time to time. Gosh, it never goes away, right? I mean, I don't know if you do it, Jenny, but... I even have OCD in this, well, both forms, but in this sense, <laughs> with my former self. Like, sometimes I'll be like, well, two years ago in yoga, I could have done this, and <laughs> lately I haven't been going as much. It's, it's crazy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Right. Or yeah. Or even, yeah, with this and even comparing your own books, uh, like, like I do that, like this book was more successful than this book. And no, <laughs> I hope this book is more, you know, and you're like, now your own books are, you know, and so it never stops. There's know, never that mention social media. Oh gosh. And, and that's what kills us, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, and I often say, you know, I put it in this way that we used to have to go to your, our 10 year reunion, right? Whether it's high school, college, your 10 year reunion, and you go there and you look everybody up and down and you play the game for one night to see who's doing better better than whom, right? And you just had to fake it for one night. You could rent the BMW. You could rent a spouse <laughs> and some kids. You could lose 40 pounds, get a toupee, like do whatever it took, fake it for one night, and then you could go back home, back to your parents' couch, delivering pizzas, and no one would have to know. Because you made your you made the perception reality that night. Well, now obviously, we're tr- we're trying to pull that off in some ways. I think every single day, and we're looking at other people's images that are also trying to pull that off every single day, and so it becomes very exhausting. And I think it really blocks authenticity. I think it blocks us from from, from for those who are struggling, and th- that's why I ask in the book. You know, are you struggling to make it appear like you're not struggling? I thought that was a great question. And and I think that speaks to all of us. You know, obviously you don't want to put all your hurts and feeling, you don't want to be the, you know, the person who's always just complaining on social media. But also we need to bring that authenticity and talking about, okay, this is what I'm struggling with. This is what I'm going through. Here, here's I'm here, here's where I am on the journey. And oftentimes that's what people connect with. Anyway, you know, we don't connect over our pretend perfection. We connect over our shared struggle. That idea of, oh, I've been there too. Oh, he, oh, she gets me. He gets me. And then you help point them to some answers. But obsessive comparison disorder, which I, which I talked about a lot in my first book, 101 Secrets to Your 20s. And then I talk about it again in this new book. Um, man, it just, it just will kill all your momentum. And it really make you feel anxious and stressed out and, and for no reason uh, because we're, we're not being comfortable enough with our own story. We're not working on writing our own story. We're focused on everybody else's stories and how do we get their story as part of our story. Right. It's, it's wild how common it is. Uh, it's even comforting to hear you talk about it. <laughs> like, just oh, something man. That, and, and what you said of it never goes away. I have to remind myself that too, that there is a part of me who that would wish, well, how do I just solve this and never compare again? Yeah, but that's not that likely, you know, it's gonna happen. But it's probably it's more about just having awareness and recognizing, oh, hey, I'm doing that thing again. Yeah. What, what can that inform about how my next move as a yeah. task? What's totally. My yeah. What's my right next move? move? Yeah. yeah. What is my next right <laughs> move? Which yeah, friendly as well. It is. You're totally right. And it <laughs> and it also, you know, and and I even talk about anxiety in the book because I struggle. I mean, I think like most of us, I struggle with anxiety. I've struggled with depression. And sometimes for me, if I sit back and pinpoint, okay, why am I feeling anxious right now? Like, what is it? You know, and I've had these moments where it's like, well, I just had some great time with my kids. That's not it. I had great time with my wife. Oh, it's because I just checked Instagram Mm. and I saw that picture of a friend and how well their book is doing or their new online course that they're launching that's going to be another million dollar seller or, you know, whatever. (laughs) And I'm feeling anxious, like, oh, crap. Oh, I got to start doing some stuff. I got to write a blog. I got to start sending some emails out, you know, and just feel this frantic fear, really. And and so it even gets down, okay, why am I feeling anxious? Is this real? Should I be feeling anxious about this? Um, You know, probably not. And you, again, just asking myself those questions. It's like a daily thing. So that hopefully I co- I come I combat I combat that anxiety at the beginning, instead of letting it run rampant for like two days, hmm. without even realizing like where did where was the source where did this start and let me block that uh, and then fix the problem. Yeah, there's what a great question. Just what is the source? Yeah, and what is this, Paul? What is one question that you wish somebody would ask you? 
Oh man. One question that I wish somebody could ask me, um, you know, how do you look so good at 34 <laughs> with three kids? I wish somebody would ask me that, I but mean, nobody, nobody is ever asking me that. No, there's a You're reason a why nobody's asking me that. dapper, handsome. <laughs> No, usually if you've seen my wife and you've met my wife, Jenny, she's usually the one that's getting, you know, how do you look so good? You know, she's still getting carded. I can't take her to the store when I'm buying alcohol with her because she still gets carded, which is so they won't let me buy the alcohol. They think I'm buying it for some minor. Uh, (laughs) They don't realize that she's older than me. You know, Um, no, that's not exactly the question I wish uh, people would ask me. Um, You know, I don't know. I, I think I think a lot of the questions that I write about, obviously in the book, I write about them because they're important questions that I've wrestled with, that I've been asked. And, and some of it's coming from mentors, uh, in different ways. And, um, so I, I I guess a question that I love and I wish people would continue to ask me is who would you not be able to help if you give up now? Mm -hmm. And I think for all of us, if you're pursuing something, You know, it's like, there's somebody out there. There's a lot of people out there that, that need what you bring. They need that, the health, the answer you've got it. And and who are you not going to be able to help if you give it up right now because it's becoming too hard or you can't see the end or it doesn't feel like you're experiencing the success. And I, I know I need to continually hear that because I'm constantly feeling like, man, is this worth it? Or should I keep going? But it's like, no, who, who, who am I not going to be able to help if I stop? Because I feel like this is something I cannot not do. So I better keep doing it. Mm. That is such a powerful one. Well, thank you. Yeah, I love that as a way of finding, finding, reconnecting to that motivation and that purpose. Yeah, a perspective. It's just constantly like getting perspective. Mm. Because I think the war is is constantly, you know, our day to day life is constantly warring against that perspective. That kind of long tail game of in your roots going deep. It's it's trying to get you shallow and getting afraid and making really rash decisions instead of getting perspective and getting your roots deep again. This reminds me of your amazing Q and A number twenty five, which I'll read for listeners. Question, instead of trying to solve life's big problems late at night as an anxious exhaustion swallows me like a black fog, should I try something more productive like, you know, going to sleep? Answer, (laughs) the morning is magnificently redemptive. Yeah. What a simple Q&A, but then I love (laughs) how the question just had all the anxiety imbued into it. And then the wiser you just says, the morning is magnificently (laughs) redemptive. Yeah, you're right. (sighs) Man, and I need to read some of that. And I know you. <laughs> I know you are really passionate about this. Well, as well, Jenny, like the the routines of it all, you know, mm. and like being mindful of the routines. I and, have FOMO for mornings. Like I don't stay out late <laughs> at night sometimes because I have advanced FOMO if I miss my morning rituals. <laughs> I think that's a great. If you're gonna have a FOMO. <laughs> If you're going to yellow with your FOMO, I think I think this is the best way to do it. I think that's a healthy way to go, for sure. Can I tell you on a side note? I <laughs> always I explained to my grandma the word YOLO. You only live <laughs> once. Yeah. And she then shared it with her friends. They're in their, you know, 80s. Some of them are younger, but my grandma's yeah. in the 80s. And they created a group of five women called the YOLOs. And they go oh. have all these adventures together. Isn't that oh my gosh. amazing? Like the it, best manifestation of YOLO I've ever heard. That, that is YOLO at its finest. That's Absolutely. what I can, I can get behind YOLO. <laughs> when it's going like that, you know, I that's like the totally. sister. What is it? The sisterhood yeah, of traveling of the traveling pants, right? I have I've never seen it, but that's what it. <laughs> I feel like that's what it's going to be like. That's the third sequel right there, or totally. fourth sequel. The Yolo. I even got them pins. Like I found pins on the internet. <laughs> anyway, that's a that's a big digression. But well, let's 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 run with that. So Yolo, Paul. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, as you look ahead, launching a book is a big deal. It's a ton of work, and it's also this culmination of a massive effort that sometimes I don't know if you. Found on this but afterward it's like this chasm opens this what's yeah. next valley yeah, yeah 
Um, how do you tackle that? And and even as you look toward what's next after promoting this, I'm sort of breaking my own rules to ask you because that's two steps ahead. And I don't think you should have to know. But <laughs> in case you do, we'd love to hear. Um, it does always help me to have various projects I'm working on and like and have bigger things that I have some groundwork that I'm working on. So, it, and I think just from a business perspective too, it's smart because then it's not like, oh, I'm writing everything on this one book launch. And if it fails, then my family's not eating, you know? And it also helps me just from a perspective standpoint, again, being like, okay, well, there's, there's other stuff going on, you know? And, um, and hopefully I'm not putting too much of my worth into the perceived success of this book launch. And, uh, if it goes really well or if it goes terribly, hopefully I'm not going to let it crush me, uh, in either capacity, you know, and it's like that great quote from mother Teresa where she talks about true humility. And if, if you're truly humble, uh, nothing will phase you or nothing will crush you, neither praise nor disgrace because you know who you are. Mm. And I guess it's getting, getting back down to that signature sauce that, that, uh, just that peace with yourself. So that even if like, you know, an amazing thing happened and like a thousand people were leaving reviews on Amazon telling me how amazing I am and how amazing this book <laughs> is, you know, hopefully that doesn't change me or affect me or, you know, get me out of this space of doing what I know I need to do versus as well, if a hundred people, a thousand people got on and told me how terrible the book is, hopefully that doesn't crush me because I know who I am. And if I felt like I did really good work and if I felt like this was the best I could have done. And this is going to help people. If it's not going to help everybody, then I can just be comfortable in that. And that's easier said than done. And I'm trying to tell myself that as I lead up to the book launch, uh, and the book comes out and it is definitely, it feels like a stressful, anxious time. Mm. Um, but yeah, moving on from there, you know, I, I hopefully will keep doing a range of different things. Um, one of which would be a, a kind of a leadership book that I'm working on because I do a lot of speaking on leading millennials or generational dynamics in the workplace. Uh, and so I'm working on that book, more of a business type book next. Awesome. And what you were saying, one of my former Google colleagues, David Kim used to say, because we were all trainers, we would interact with a lot of people. He said, don't let compliments go to your head and don't let criticism go to your heart. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I love that. So as we wrap up, I always like to leave listeners with one mini assignment that they can do when they stop listening. So what would you, what would you encourage people to do after this episode ends? Man, um, let's, I would let's love give if, them a question, maybe even your yeah, favorite I would, question. I would love if they, if they start wrestling with a question, um, you know, maybe one, and I think we've, we've heard this before and we maybe thought about this before, but I, but I like putting it in the, in the phrase of, what are the pivotal plot points of your story? Nice tie in there. I love it. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> what are the, what are some major triumphs and tragedies? You know, and tragedies might sound too Shakespearean, but, but failures or hard things you've had to work through. What are some major triumphs and tragedies that you've gone through in the past? And what was happening during that triumph? Like, what were you actually tangibly doing? And then what was happening in the tragedy? Like, what were you working through? And, and I love giving, again, that context and perspective because you can start pulling out, okay, this is where I feel most successful. This is where I've experienced some hurt and pain, and this is probably why I'm passionate about helping others not go through the same thing. I think it's just a good perspective exercise. Um, and then also figuring out, you know, what are your favorite stories, which, again, can feel like AP English. You know, this doesn't feel that profound. But I found it to be very profound to even think about, okay, why are these three movies my favorite? Well, there's probably something about the story that is speaking into my story hmm. as the underdog who goes through all kinds of obstacles and experiences success that no one else thought was possible. Those, that's usually kind of the theme of every one of my favorite stories. Totally. Um, and so I think that's a helpful exercise. Um, and, and then people can get – you know, if they want to, they, they can get 10 questions, I think, for free on my website from the book. So if you want to go to the website, allgrownup.com, G-R-O-A-N, like you're groaning in pain, <laughs> allgrownup, 
It's still the same. I've been doing that for years. Um, but you can get 10 questions. So you can wrestle with some more too. If you don't want to go full fledged and buy the $11 book, you can get the, some sample questions and start working through some of these. But yeah, the pivotal plot points of your story, what are those? And what's important about that? I love how you include triumphs and tragedies in mapping those pivotal pivotal plot points. (laughs) I wouldn't have thought to do that, but I really, that's such a cool exercise. I mean, we could all even get out a piece of paper and mark those pivotal plot points. Yeah. And then I'm going to throw out one of my questions that I loved, which is number 63. What are my top five soul values? And I think that's a really cool one. Yeah, I think... Again, it's something that we don't think about. We think we know our values, but have we actually sat down and wrote down our values and even tried to rank our top values, our soul values from one to five? Right. And, and I had, are they, because sometimes our values are actually society's values or we, yeah. or they're not the soul values. Like what's deep in your soul yeah. if, you had, if it had nothing to do with being socially acceptable? Yeah. What is number one for you? And if you think back to it, and, and if if you're not being true to that value, you're going to feel anxious. You're going to feel depressed. You're going to feel like you're missing it. And a lot of the times, I think that's why people feel frustrated at work. It's not necessarily a skill set issue. They might even be experiencing a lot of skill success at work. But maybe a value of theirs is not being met. And it's a top value. Absolutely. And so they feel anxious, but they don't they don't know necessarily that, oh, there's this huge value of mine that I can't do here at work. And that's why I feel so bad. So I, I had a mentor that forced me to do this, a guy named Ray Rude. And uh, and it was a really challenging exercise. So I kind of passed that forward in this book uh, and ranking your top soul values. Mm. And sometimes that value is freedom or uh, rest, things that sometimes are not supported. By yes, the jobs we hold. Yes, exactly. Or for me, it's authenticity, yeah. which is why I always was terrible. I started figuring out that's why I was terrible at sales jobs when I was selling something I didn't really necessarily believe in, because I just my 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 value for authenticity would just it wouldn't even allow me to sell this in any kind of persuasive way, because I just felt like, man, I want to tell you not to get this. <laughs> It's and, like, and, and that totally. doesn't, it's, it's not a good money maker, <laughs> you know? So I'm a terrible salesman when I'm not talking about something that I like truly oh deep down gosh. feel like this is important, you know? One of the things I love the most about your signature sauce is your humor. And it's Thank baked you. right into your URL. As you said, it's all grown as in a grown. Yes, <laughs> that's grown. right. Yes. Yes. So everybody, I really encourage you to check it out. Paul writes with such humor and heart and soul and authenticity to the core. This is definitely so present. I mean, he starts this new book with a breakup story. Um. <laughs> that's right. An epic breakup story. An epic breakup story. Paul, I can't thank you enough for being here and for your well, friendship and inspiration and humor over the years. Thank well, you so thank, much. Well, thank you, Jenny, for having me. I've always looked up to you as this pinnacle of how to do an online business and author. And I haven't stopped looking up to you. So I thank you for all your support and encouragement. It means the world to me. Thank you so much. Well, we're in it together. That's (laughs) That's right. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Pivot Podcast. Make sure you don't miss an episode or my insider tips and templates by signing up for Pivot List, a curated twice monthly newsletter where I share the inside scoop on what I'm reading, watching, listening to, and the latest tools I'm geeking out on. Sign up at pivotmethod.com slash pivotlist. Get show notes from this episode at pivotmethod.com slash podcast and connect with me on Twitter at Jenny underscore Blake. Remember, build first, then your courage will follow. Hasn't it always?